This is the lecture for European history for Friday, the 25th of February 2022. There's a reality that some people need to at least consider. The world is not led by people like you. The world is not populated exclusively by people like you. There's a certain type of modern narcissism, or maybe it's just optimism, that says that I know what I would want to do in certain circumstances. And therefore, this is what should be done. Because if the world were led by or populated exclusively by people like you, that would make sense. Problems would be solved. Crises would be averted. For example, you may want to live in a world where people are reasonable and prefer, prefer diplomacy over war. From your point of view, there's no need for war. Ever. War is a sign of degeneracy or debasement or failure because you couldn't imagine ever wanting to go to war. You would have difficulty imagining anything so important as to require you to fight to the death. This particular form of narcissism self-absorption was very much on display at the end of the Vietnam War in the United States. A bunch of left-wing, pro-communist, anti-war demonstrators managed to persuade the majority of the American people, <laughs> along with a very poorly fought war, not by the soldiers, but by the politicians and generals who badly planned it, underestimated our enemy, and all the rest. So I grew up in a country that was deeply steeped in pacifism. America in the 1970s, 80s, and early 90s, between the Vietnam War's end in 1975 and the first Gulf, Persian Gulf War of 1991, the idea of going to war under almost any reasonable circumstances was anathema, unthinkable to most Americans. And because they didn't think that going to war was necessary, they supported cutting the defense budget, gutting the CIA, reducing this country's ability to fight, spy, or engage in hardcore action overseas. It weakened America. It was only with the surprisingly easy victory in the Gulf War that Americans' attitudes began to change. And after 9-11, we were filled with a righteous anger. We had been attacked with no warning. Our civilians were murdered. and We were going to stop this from ever happening again. Of course, we lost our way, lost our focus, and instead of fighting to conquer Iran, we decided to call it good with Afghanistan and Iraq. That's not enough. It never was going to be enough. Russian Federation is led by a predator. The reason that he and Trump understood one another is that Trump was also a predator. The Romans considered themselves to be wolves among men, inheriting wolfish qualities from the she-wolves that Romulus and Remus sucked from, ambition, ruthlessness, and tender love of family. Romans looked on the world when they were at their peak with a, hung with a hunger a hunger for conquest, a hunger for opportunities to be exploited, a hunger for dominion. This is true of every society as it's on the rise. What kicked this sense of gleeful conquest out of us was a war that happened 110 years ago, 108 years ago, World War I where for four and a half years, the best thing that Western civilization could think of doing was hurling their best young men at one another with bayonets against machine guns. 
After World War I, Western civilization became more mature, more reflective. We still had a second world war, of course. But World War II ended in May of 19, well, August of 1945. 78 years ago. Most people with living memory of that war are gone. It's been long enough for a new generation of leaders to take power in China, Russia, the United States, Europe, Asia, throughout the world. And those things that we once learned at great cost, the most important job of a government is to prevent a general war. And if one happens to win it, has been lost. Bear this in mind. What you think would be a reasonable peace offer, you as a reasonable person, a person willing to compromise, a person who may or may not be Christian, but who is certainly steeped in Christian notions of the value of human life and the benefits of peace, you don't understand. The world is run by predators. Always has been. We are the exception in the West. And not always, but we are usually in the age of democracy and republics, constitutional monarchies and parliamentary systems. We are usually led by politicians. But Putin didn't get where he was by being a politician. He's a colonel in the KGB, was always, will always be. Which means he, in essence, is a spy. And his training was in dirty tricks overseas. It has taken him 22 years to get enough, 23 years to get enough power in Russia to do what he wanted to do and to be met in the West by weakness, vacillation, confusion. with the result being that he seems to be on the march. Now, the Ukrainians seem to be fighting, and they seem to be fighting hard, and I wish them the best. I hope we support them. However, let's assume that it is a numbers game and that the Russians will inevitably win. Why on earth should Putin stop with Ukraine? Moldova is probably ripe for conquest, so is Belarus. Which puts Russia right up against NATO. And gives Russia much of the former Soviet territories. Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan's already taken. Uh, Kyrgyzstan. All of those would come back, and you have most of the Soviet Union reunified. If you're dealing with a reasonable person, reasonable peace measures work. If you're dealing with a predator, force works. You are wonderful people. Thoughtful, civilized, self-disciplined, educated, ambitious, in the best possible way. I admire all of you, even the goofy ones. I don't think any of you are predators. You have to understand the world has people in it that are evil, dangerous, and who would happily take everything that you have and everything that you are just for the fun of it. And around the world outside of the Western democracies, these are the people who take power. Most vicious, ruthless, violent, brutal people. That's why I have contempt for the United Nations organization. I think it was an idealistic idea to begin with, thus it doesn't appeal to me. 
But in a world run by European empires that had some democratic process, the United Nations made some sense. In a world run by third world dictators, it doesn't. The Russians presided over the meeting that dealt with the Ukraine crisis. China is on the UN Human Rights Council. It's a clown show. I guess my point in this ramble, which you can certainly offer your thoughts on if you want, is to remember to be humble. The world is not run by people like you. And the world is not fully inhabited by people like you. Therefore, you cannot presume to understand what is reasonable, what is proportionate, what is... You just can't use yourself as the measure for all people. Just as Americans cannot assume that everyone around the world is a cheeseburger eating apple pie, eating American under the skin. That is simply not true. Culture matters. Not race, but culture. Yet, Americans, this is one of our cardinal sins. Many of us just blithely assume that everyone's like that. No, they're not. So as you observe the world situation and try to make sense of it, try to accept the difficult reality <laughs> that there truly are different people with different motives. Could in old-fashioned terms, absolutely be classified as being evil. There are people that you can't reason with. And if you have ever had any personal experience with a real bully, you should know that. But as people get older, one of the things that people do as they become adults is they put blinders on them. And they imagine that the world is as they want it to be. And one of the worst places for this is college, because it's all theories, it's all ideas. And because the type of person that usually becomes a college professor is just like that, willing to imagine that the world makes sense according to their theoretical models. It doesn't. International law matters far less than the law of street fighting. And the law of street fighting is kick the other guy in the vitals before he does it to you. Win at all costs. Survive. It's a disturbing reality for being given a front row seat at what happens when people like that think they have an opportunity. And you should think about it. You shouldn't be depressed about it. This is normal. You should think about it. You should try to understand it. You should try to develop a wisdom about it. You owe that to yourself. Do any of you have any information, thoughts, comments, disagreements, anything else on the current situation before we go back? David. Um, Sorry, that's... I uh, heard something about America reaching DEFCON 3 and uh, some nations in Europe reaching DEFCON 2. That's reasonable, under the circumstances. Defense conditions are a Cold War anachronism that are coming back. DEFCON 5 is peace. DEFCON 1 is full-scale nuclear war, or at least a conventional shooting war. On several occasions in my life, we moved to DEFCON 2. Before I was born, the Cuban Missile Crisis had us on the verge of DEFCON 1. Europe should be on DEFCON 2. If I were anywhere near Russia, I would make damn sure that uh, my military was ready to fight. If I were in Taiwan, I would make damn sure my military is ready to fight. If I was in Japan, the same thing. Because I'm telling you, the Chinese are going to try to exploit this in some way. We in the United States bringing to ourselves to Defense Condition 3 is a good and wise and prudent move. Frankly, we should have our bombers in the air doing what we used to do in the, Soviet, in the Cold War, which is we fly patrols up to the edge of Soviet airspace and back and back, forward and back. There are always bombers in the air ready to get a go order to nuclear 
to, to engage in a nuclear attack. Our missile forces should always be at that state anyway, including our submarines. I don't think Putin is suicidal. I don't think he wants a nuclear war. I think he's an opportunist. And I think that uh, if, if met by enough force, he'll stop or back off. So to me, it's reasonable. But it's certainly nerve-wracking, isn't it? Did you have more? Oh. Can you explain, you said DEFCON 1, 2, three. Okay. Americans, particularly at the height of the Cold War, love a few things. They love, they love uh, acronyms, like NATO. Europeans alone would never have come up with an alliance that was abbreviated by its initials. But we Americans, oh yeah, it's new, it's modern, it's 20th century, NATO. Uh, no, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or they just call it the Atlantic Alliance. We call it NATO. DEFCON uh, is for from defense conditions, and the idea is, um, imagine a facility with different levels of alert status. Say, say this campus was a fortress, a military base, which is not. Uh, DEFCON 5 would be us doing our thing as normal. DEFCON 1 would not just be lockdown, it would be me arming myself, arming you, and going out and fighting the bad guys that were coming over the walls. Um, the other stages are stages between them. DEFCON 4 is we're all watching, we have our doors locked, we're ready to go into lockdown. DEFCON 3 would be lockdown. DEFCON 2 would be lockdown uh, and sending out patrols to at least find out what the heck's going on. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what it is. It's simply a system that uh, is used to as shorthand to determine what sorts of military steps we're taking. What David talked about was that some European militaries are moving to a status just short of war because they are concerned by what is happening in the Ukraine. Um, and that's wise. I, I, again, I, I would do the same thing. Uh, the American military moving to DEFCON 3 is also not a bad idea since we backstop the European vent. We also backstop Taiwan, Japan, and the rest. Um, I think us moving to DEFCON 2 is entirely possible, depending upon how Putin and the Chinese play it. Uh, okay, Haley. Um, so I think it's kind of dumb, to say the least, that we have press still in Ukraine. So like CNN and everybody is like War correspondents are an old thing. That, that actually is not something that uh, disturbs me much because the the, the Ru we yeah I, I get what you're saying, but if the Russians observe basic rules of war, the, our press will be fine. Uh, unless of course our press get hit by artillery, in which case they won't be fine. But they took that risk when they became a war correspondent. Being a war correspondent means you're going after the action. You're going to be danger endangered. Go on. They're just like I was watching a CNN video, and they're like running behind all these soldiers who are shooting at people, and they're just like getting like really close to them. And yeah. Like, that as much as I don't like CNN, that takes guts. Oh yeah, for sure. I or or hubris. Like, why would you want to risk your life over... To get the that? story. A, a real journalist will do that. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, talk about, like, Defcon. So that's also has a hold over from the Cold War. Speak up a little. So when you talk about Defcon, is that a hold over from the Cold War that, that is influenced in terms of just military bases themselves? Like, since the 20th century, military bases force protection. So there's those different levels. There's, the bottom level isn't even, like, level. Like, that's what they call it. Yeah. Like on the actual chart. Oh. Yeah. And then it goes Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta. I think it goes over to Pastra, which it's which right now I think Bear Child that like four pound Charlie, which is like it goes from normal to we check IDs mm -hmm. to we check IDs and we check your car and we go and we search you and then nobody gets in and we can tell like how Delta. Yeah. As it should be. And I think, again, if, if they brought up themselves up to Charlie, that makes sense. That's equivalent to Fairchild. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, I, I know Fairchild is an important base. And and one of the facts uh, is that during the Cold War, we had our military forces far more dispersed than they are now. We have fewer bases, so each of them is a juicier target. Uh, yes, and then I guess we'll move on. That's cool. Go ahead. Um, do you think that Russia will try to reclaim its previous territories under the Soviet Union, like Poland? If they do that, it'll be full-scale. If they go after any NATO member, 
we're obliged legally and morally to go to war. They know that. We know that. If the Russians cozy up to the border of the Baltic states or Poland, they may try to intimidate the politicians there. But if they actually try force against a NATO member, we're at war full scale. They know that. We know that. Now, whether they're deterred by that or not is a question of whether they respect our strength. They should. The American military has more active combat experience than any other military in the world today because of the 20-year war on terror. Now, the war on terror is a small-scale guerrilla war. You know, it's, it's like a brush fire war. But it still is combat experience. We have a lot of people who've seen combat. And one of the realities of any military is there are those people who've been in combat and come back alive, and there's everyone else. And you can be the most elite, scary, spetsnaz, uh, that is uh, elite Soviet troop or Russian troop uh, that you want to be. If you haven't been where people are dying and killing, you've not seen combat. And you don't know how things are going to be. So my hope is that they will take that very seriously. They should. Because, again, that, that trips us over into general war. My experience, my understanding of Russian history is that under the czars, under the commissars, and now under Putin, when they're in a phase of aggression, they tend to be opportunists. That means they don't tend to push things beyond a certain point. The Chinese, <clears throat> that's a different story. But, yeah. Ah, uh, yes. Do you know if you and <coughs> That's okay. <coughs> Do you know if you and members are allowed to go to war with each other? We do all the time. Which I find hilarious. Yeah, well, it's because the UN. Don't, don't even get me started on <laughs> The UN doesn't have a military. The UN does not have governmental powers. I think that's a good thing because I, I don't want to be dominated by a bunch of third world dictators. Best. There's a video going around of two Spice Mouse guys. Oh, yeah. Kind yeah. Fast rip off of an MIA. And once they get like 20 meters above the ship deck, they both just let go. Yeah. Yeah, the, these these Russian special forces were trying to take a Ukrainian warship, and um, they yeah they were going down a rope and then they let go. And the thing about falling from twenty feet onto a steel deck is it hurts. Uh, they they probably broke their legs. Yeah. Well, no, and the I'm, I'm amazed the Ukrainians weren't just shooting the, the helicopter down, but I'm sure they're. I will say this, there's a story of 13 Ukrainian soldiers on a river island, and a Russian warship uh, gunboat comes up to it and says, you should surrender now to avoid bloodshed. The Ukrainians signaled, go bleep yourself, and uh, then they were wiped out. Courageous words, at least. At least they didn't surrender. But no, this, is, this is real. This is not a video game. You all know that. It's not a movie. It's, it's, it's real. Um, anyway. To the extent you participated, thank you for the conversation. To the extent you listened, thank you for your attention on that. Now we go to a warrior society. Japan is one of the few genuine warrior societies on the planet. Uh, Japan um, has a unique system of government and religion. Their religion is called Shinto. It is animistic paganism. It's the belief that everything has a soul. What distinguishes Japanese Shinto from most forms of paganism is they include works made by human beings as including having a soul. So the Imperial Japanese battleship Yamato, largest battleship ever made, had a soul, had a spirit, a kami, a divine spirit, K-A-M-I. So what does this have to do with modern Japan? Well, Naruhito is the emperor of Japan. Naruhito is a lineal descendant of the sun goddess Amaterasu Mikami. The Japanese live in the presence of a god. Their land is the land of the awakened gods. It's a land of earthquakes, volcanoes, tidal waves, typhoons. It's a dangerous place. Beautiful, but dangerous. And the Japanese that arrive at the beginning of their historical era and displace the Caucasian Ainu, um, start out as rice farmers, as warriors, but they have this god emperor. And they also live in such a dangerous place that Japan, unlike most societies, is very group-oriented. It is naturally group-oriented. 
if there were a society on Earth that would be primed to become genuinely communistic, not in the sense we've ever seen, it is Japan. Because Japan is all about the group. If you're a new student in a Japanese school, you come before the class of your peers. You bow low. You say, hello, I'm happy to be here. I hope I learn a lot from each and every one of you. You show respect to the classmates that are here. And you're basically low man on the totem pole for a while until you work your way into the social status. But you are expected to defer. You are expected to bend like a willow. Why? Because in a society where so many natural disasters happen, if you stand out on your own, you're useless. You've got to pull together in a crisis. The God Emperor intensifies all of this. In the Middle Ages, the samurai rule like Japanese knights, but there's no chivalry. Bushido, the way of the warrior, is about the samurai ruling over the people. If a samurai gets a new sword and wants to test its edge, he'll cut the head off a fisherman. That's not only legal, it's totally fine. It's normal. The people belong to their lords. The lords belong to the god emperor. The sense of individualism that we in the West instinctively have is not there as a and when they import Confucianism, the idea of the group harmony becomes even more intense. In the 1500s, Japan was divided. And there are three lords, and I've told you about these. Each of these lords, Nobunaga, Hideyoshi, Tokugawa, Ieyasu, try to conquer Japan and become shogun, which is military dictator. Each of them to some degree or another, employ Western guns that have come in with the Portuguese. Guns, cannon, muskets. Finally, in the year 1600, Tokugawa Ieyasu at the Battle of Sekigahara conquers Japan. He becomes shogun. The emperor is still there, but the emperor is a figurehead. He lives in a pleasure palace. He does ceremonial things. Tokugawa and his successors the Tokugawa shoguns, rule Japan. And Tokugawa decides a couple of things, and his descendants do too. Japan will not continue to be poisoned by foreigners. Because foreigners, with their guns and their new ideas, made the 1500s in Japan so dangerous. Tokugawa says it's the foreign influences that caused all these civil wars. So, as China restricted trade to the city of Canton, or Guangzhou, Japan restricts the, city, the trade with the outside world to the city of Nagasaki, which is the only Japanese city that has any Christian population of any size. And only the Dutch are allowed to come a couple of times a year. Any other foreign ship that comes ashore in Japan is going to be butchered. The crew are going to be killed by the samurai as invaders. And the thing about the storm he sees off Japan is a lot of ships end up coming ashore in Japan and the crews are killed. For 200 years, as China had closed itself off from the early to mid 1600s to the early to mid 1800s, Japan does even more so. As China turns away from Christianity after the Kangxi Emperor realizes who the Pope is, Tokugawa's successor and son bans Christianity, crucifies any Christians and Christian priests who continue to practice Christianity underground once the ban is in effect. Foreigners are expelled. Japan is closed off. And it, it is a time of peace. It's a time of prosperity. It's a time of artistic development. But the Tokugawa shogunate from the early 1600s to the early 1800s is also a time of technological and cultural stagnation, just as, as it is in China. They're hiding from the world. In 1853, we're going to change that. The United States and Japan have a unique relationship with one another, almost as special as the relationship between England or Britain and the United States. In 1853, American Commodore Matthew Perry and the Pacific Battle Squadron sails into Tokyo Bay. 
They fire a salute in honor of the Emperor. Marines come ashore and deliver a formal message to the Emperor. The formal message is, we, the government of the United States, the people of the United States, invite you to join the world. We invite you to open your country to trade. We will be back to receive your answer, and they, they set a date and everyone is polite and correct and they leave and uh the japanese realize oh, we have allowed ourselves to had had those black ships with those modern guns and those marines wanted to they could have shelled the imperial palace yeah our guys made sure to let them know we had the range to do that they could have sent Marines with their modern weapons and captured or killed the God Emperor. The purpose of the Japanese nation is to protect and serve the God Emperor. The Tokugawa shogunate, by stagnating for two centuries while Europe develops industry, and America too, have placed the Emperor at risk. The entire purpose of the country is now in question. And the Tokugawa shoguns are now in a position of decline and weakness because they're the ones who did it. When Perry comes back, a series of negotiations ensue, which open Japan. As in China, the foreigners begin to arrive and take some property and start doing foreigner things in Japan, in Nihon in land of the rising sun, the land of the awakened gods, in the land of the god emperor. This bothers people. One of the worst movies about recent history is a movie with Tom Cruise about the Japanese called The Last Samurai. It's basically almost a shot-for-shot -shot remake of Dances with Wolves, which is a bunch of, bunch of anti-American, pro-Native American propaganda. But this time, in place of the poor, innocent natives who lived utopian lives until evil white man showed up, it's the poor, innocent Japanese samurai. <clears throat> Do you remember what I said about the samurai? They ruled with naked force. They had absolute brutality. Uh, samurai culture is a culture of war and death. They're not innocent. They're not innocent noble savages brought into the modern world by, by the serpent uh, in the Garden of Eden, which is us. So, a group of politicians around the emperor decide to restore the emperor to real power. It's called the Meiji Restoration in honor of the Meiji Emperor. The Meiji Restoration displaces the Tokugawa Shogunate, displaces the samurai, replaces them with a modern army, at first advised by Frenchmen, then after the Franco-Prussian War, advised by Germans. They're going to build a fleet. At first built in British naval yards with British naval officers, and then as time goes on, as Japan's industry, which is based on American industry, is built up, they're going to start building their own warships, and their warships are at least as good, in some cases significantly better, than ships built in Britain. The Meiji Restoration brings Japan into the modern age from the top down. The God Emperor decrees, and his government, which is now going to be based on Britain's constitutional monarchy, Japan gets a parliament, it's called the Diet. Japan is going to modernize fast. Japan is going to become more Western than the Westerners. Japan is going to have a modern army, first class, modern navy, first class, modern industrial uh, plant, first class. Japan is going to modernize. Wearing swords in public is outlawed. Wearing kimonos except in ceremonial occasions. No, no, no. We will modernize. Now, Russia did this under Peter the Great, and it only worked to an extent. 
But the Japanese, remember, are more naturally communitarian than anyone in Europe certainly is. So in Japan, the entire country turns on a dime. This is not the last time this will happen. I'm going to say this again. You have an entire nation of tens of millions of people who were isolated under the shoguns, and then in a very short time, because of the decree of the god emperor, everything changes. But not just on the surface. The Japanese people willingly follow where the emperor is leading. It's not an imposition. Peter the Great had to forcibly shave the boyars, the Russian noblemen. In Japan, most of the samurai willingly give up their swords in hopes of becoming businessmen and army officers or navy officers or politicians. A few of the samurai cling to the old ways. A few of the samurai continue to live in the old ways and they ultimately decide to commit suicide by army. Sort of like a poor devil today committing suicide by cop. This event where the last old-style samurai fight the Imperial Army, knowing that they're going to die, is commemorated in that movie with Tom Cruise and in a song by Sabaton, which I will play. Please shut the fan, close the shades, and turn off the lights. I'm sure we're going to learn about Liberty Mutual. Maybe Grimmer. We've got to tell people that Liberty Mutual customizes no, really cards, so you only pay for what you need. And we got to do it fast. <laughs> New personal record, Limo! Only pay for what you need. Yeah. Liberty, 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 liberty. A Dodge Duster, which was my first car. He was young. <laughs> Follow Ushido. The idea that you might have heard in Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back, where Luke says that he will try, <clears throat> and Yoda says, mm, do or do not, there is no try. That's quintessentially Japanese Bushido. You're given a mission, you either accomplishment or you die trying. <clears throat> Accomplish the mission. Or die trying. Okay. <laughs> Mrs. Gennaro. Go to the bank, but... <laughs> well, we're talking samurai, so... Oh, okay. Have fun. You too. Um, okay. <laughs> Don't even want <laughs> Anywho. The, um, the samurai do not compromise. They know their ways are done. What do you do when the world has changed and you can't imagine re retooling yourself so that you can fit into it? Well, a Westerner would find a way. But to a Japanese samurai, no. What you do is you die fighting. So they create this battle on the Mount uh, Shir uh, Shiriyama. And uh, the Imperial Army with guns comes in and kills most of them and then offers them surrender. They don't want surrender. No, they're going to die. And either they die by suicide, by seppuku or harakiri, depending upon what you want to call it, or they die at the hands of the uh, imperial troops. The result of this is a new Japan, uh, the Meiji, uh, Meiji Japan. And what I'm going to do is read to you something which is um, used in every Japanese school. Yep, the Japanese build an entirely new education system based on Western models, British models in particular. 
And the god emperor himself, the emperor Meiji, um, promulgates this to his people. This is on October the 30th, 1890, Western <laughs> Reckoning. Uh, and it's, it's something that dominates Amer uh, Japanese education up through the end of World War II. Know ye our subjects, and remember, this is the royal we. Our imperial ancestors have founded our empire on a basis broad and everlasting and have deeply and firmly implanted virtue. Our subjects, ever unified in loyalty and filial piety, have from generation to generation illustrated the beauty thereof. This is the glory of the fundamental character of our empire. And herein lies the source of our education. Ye, our subjects, be filial to your parents, affectionate to your brothers and sisters, as husbands and wives be harmonious, as friends true. Bear yourselves in modesty and moderation. Extend your benevolence to all, pursue learning and cultivate arts, and thereby develop intellectual facilities and perfect uh, your moral powers. Furthermore, advance public good and promote common interests. Always respect the Constitution and observe the laws. Should emergency arise, offer yourself courageously to the state and thus guard and maintain the prosperity of our imperial throne, coeval with heaven and earth. So shall ye not only be our good and faithful subjects, but render illustrious the best traditions of your forefathers. The way here set forth is indeed the teaching bequeathed by our imperial ancestors to be observed alike by their descendants and the subjects infallible for all ages and true in all places. It is our wish to lay it at the heart in all reverence in common with you, our subjects, that we may thus attain to the same virtue. Now, this may seem like a bunch of gobbledygook to you. I read it quickly, bless you, because of time. The emperor is exhorting his people to be good, to be moderate, to be generous. If there's an emergency, to step up and do something, to make the good of his society their personal responsibility. But he is arguing, this is, this is a key to the Japanese mind. Again, the entire nation turns on a dime several times over the last 200 years. This is what the ancestors always intended. This isn't a change. It's a new expression for a new age of that same Japanese spirit. We are one people. You are mine. I, the God Emperor, am your God Emperor. It's a unique destiny. It's a glorious destiny. Be part of it. And this appeal is at the basis of generations of young Japanese learning about service to the state. And the Japanese live and die that service, at least until the second atom bomb finally gets a later emperor to uh, stop fighting. We'll talk more about Japan later. Uh, but hopefully you have an idea. Thank you for your attention. Any questions, comments, thoughts? I see none. Then we're all set. Can you get the lights, please? Turn them on.